apparently there's nobody here but me. <laughs> Doing all right? Seriously? You're gonna, uh, I know, I know, I know what happened. The groundhog got you. Hits 80 degrees, right? Groundhog doesn't see its shadow. You start folding up the sweaters and putting them away, right? Gotcha. Welcome to North Carolina. If you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Okay. Anyway, you, you'll get over it. It, 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 it's, we all, it. it does come back with a vengeance, the summer thing, in just a few weeks. So it don't work. Anyway, a couple things before I get started. One, um, we'd had, last week we talked about five and two food pantry and really working out with that. And we gave you a link that didn't really work very well to sign up to be a partner. And so I'm going to hit you again that if you were going to sign up to be a partner last week and you didn't partner somebody that signs up for 30 bucks a month, Okay, honestly, what you're going to spend on lunch today, all right, 30, we can help save this food pantry. We can do our part to save this food pantry, help and feed lots and lots of people who really need help in our community. And if you weren't planning on doing it last week, plan on it now. Just change your plans. It's not that hard. So you just pull up our app, and it, there's a link that says 5 and 2 Food Pantry. Hit that. It'll take you to the right spot. It'll say make it a regular donation, you type in 30 bucks, or more if you'd like. I'm not going to complain for more, but that money goes straight to them. We don't touch it. It goes right into their accounts, and it go goes to help feed people who actually need food in our community. Not to me, who obviously does not need food in our community. I'm doing okay. All right, so anyway, um, if you probably know this, the Bible is 66 books. It was written by literally dozens of men over hundreds of years. Somehow it manages to have a single plot that runs through the whole story, which is awesome. But in the telling of that story, there are literally thousands of people involved. Lots of them don't even get their names mentioned. They're, 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 they're just there. And then there's a bunch more. It's, it's like watching the credits to a, a superhero movie with lots of CGI. You ever sat through the whole thing? You know, like Marvel makes you sit through the whole thing to watch the last little bit there? And there's just name after name. And if you were to do the Bible, everybody who's involved, there'd be a whole bunch of unknown. I don't know who that is. This guy, this guy just walked across, and we, this person said hi to Jesus once. There's like thousands of people. And then, but like, just pretty much like in a movie, there's people that rise up. There are people that you know. There's, there's Peter, and there's, there's a few others that are there. And then, there's almost like, for the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament, there's like a Mount Rushmore. They're the ones that are the biggest, most important names in the, the first part of the Bible and the second part of the Bible. You know, Jesus is on that Mount Rushmore. One of the guys who's in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, one of the Mount Rushmore guys is a guy named Elijah. And he's an amazing, fantastic, spectacular, obnoxious, ama he's just a wonderful guy to read. He just does amazing things. And he does such amazing things that as... The, the narrative of the Bible goes on. He just rises in importance. And it becomes the case that he is central and integral to God's prophecy throughout the rest of, the, of history. Elijah's in the middle of all this prophecy. He's just hugely important. And what people, a lot of people don't recognize because you read the story fast and you, and you don't want to see. You, you read and you don't want to see certain things. Is that Elijah has one absolutely phenomenal, spectacular victory... And as soon as that victory is over, he plunges into an intense depression. He literally asks God to kill him. He runs away for weeks, finds himself hiding in a cave. And what people don't like to notice is he's never the same. He never gets over it. He goes into this depressed state, and while he does function, he's never the same person. He's never as important. He's never as big a deal. He never really recovers from that depression. Now, I bring that up because t today we're continuing our series, Shh, the things we don't want to talk about, and we're going to talk today about depression, depression and suicide. And I, I could give you lots of statistics, but you've heard them. I could talk about suicide, I could talk about depression, the number of people who have deal with each of those, but I'm sure either... Everyone in here, you either A, have been strongly impacted by someone who committed suicide, you personally wrestle with depression, or you have a close family member who does, or some mix of all those. 
And so today we're going to tackle a topic nobody wants to talk about, and we're going to talk about depression. And before I get started, though, I need, I need to cover one thing. It's kind of like a question everybody has, a lot of people have, and I want to tackle that question, get that out of the way before we start. Because one of the questions that, that lots of people ask is when it comes to the concept of depression, and especially suicide, and I just want to get this question out of the way, is what happens to someone who commits suicide? Is, is suicide a one-way ticket to hell? I mean, does that mean you have separated yourself from God eternally by that action? And a lot of you have opinions on this, and I've, I've got the Bible, so I'm going to go with my opinion, okay? okay? And here's, here's the point I want to make. I want to just make one point real fast, and then three verses will move on. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to an, that relationship with God, salvation isn't about your last, last action. Salvation is not about your last action. You can imagine Mother Teresa, end of her life, all that she's done, all she's dedicated her life to God, the relationship she had with God, all the wonderful things she does, and she's on her deathbed, the nurse comes over and drops something. And it hits her just right, and it bounces off, and it hurts. And she says, you! And she calls her a name. Just slips out. And then she dies. What happens? She, she goes to heaven because your salvation is not about the last thing you do. It's a much bigger, one, more wonderful thing than that. Let me show you some passages just to help you out here. It says in, um, in Ephesians 4, it says, don't grieve God, God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. In other words, your salvation is something that God has sealed. Let me give you a couple more real fast. Therefore, there is now no, con- no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because th- through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who, the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So, there, and one more. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, before, beyond the reach of change and decay. See, here's what most people seem to have this weird, skewed picture of salvation. Salvation happens when you acknowledge that you're a sinner, you come to God and you ask for his forgiveness, and God forgives you through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And an awful lot of people have this idea that once you accept Christ, your job is to hold tightly to salvation and make sure you don't lose it. Nothing could be further from the truth. As we see here, your salvation is held by God as a deposit. You don't even have it right now. You don't have it in your possession. Your salvation isn't in your possession. Matter of fact, let me give you, let me give you one illustration that will help you out, and you'll have this, and we won't have to talk about it too much more. Imagine you have a three-year-old and an infant, and you have to get them across a very busy four-lane highway. Now, you can't carry both of them, right? You've got the infant in your arms, and you've got a three-year-old. What do you do to the three-year-old? Do you hold their hand? Not exactly, right? When you're getting a three-year-old somewhere that's important, what do you do? Do you hold their hand, or do you grab a wrist like this? Okay? You grab that wrist, and you put a death lock on that wrist, and that kid is coming. Right? That kid is getting across the street with you. They may or may not walk across the street with you, but they are getting across the street with you. Right? And so you head across the street, and you've got this three-year-old, you've got that vice lock on that three-year-old's wrist. And when it comes to salvation, the Bible pictures over and over and over that God has you, God and his spirit, have you in a death grip on your wrist, and he is going to, the, he who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1.6. Okay? And he's got that grip on you, and he's got... Now, we could argue whether or not you have even the capacity to wiggle out of his grip, but the reality is you don't accidentally slip out of God's grip, and you don't mess up by one action. So, back to suicide. Someone has a relationship with Christ before, that action doesn't take it away. If they didn't, it doesn't change anything at all. Does that make sense? Some of you needed to hear that because you've, some of you guys are wrestling with questions because you have friends and you have family members. And so I wanted to answer that first. But that was just an introduction. So now let's talk about depression. Yay! From suicide to depression. Let's just take it up one more notch on the joy chart. Oh, let me give you a quote from me. Finish it up. No action we can perform is more powerful than Christ's action on the cross. So that's when it comes to those kind of issues. Any kind of issue, really. No action you can perform is more powerful than Christ's action on the cross. So let's deal with depression. Now, 
We're going to be very practical today and very scriptural at the same time. But I want to start off with a basic concept about mental health and how we handle things. And the first way, the first thing that we do when it comes to problems, when it comes to discouragement, depression, any of those kind of things, the first thing, the first level of defense is coping. Coping. Coping is getting the mental... Your, your notes don't say coping. They say something really long. But I abbreviated it because I wanted something more tighter. First step is coping. Coping is developing the mental things that help you deal with problems. Anybody ever learn to count to ten when you get angry? Okay? Coping is where when a problem comes in, and most of us, most, I mean, all, not most, all of us have a number of things that we have developed coping mechanisms for, and we deal with stuff pretty easily when it comes to that, or, we, or even difficult, challenging things. We have learned how to cope. We've learned the mental gymnastics that are necessary to survive in life with discouragement, because if you can't, you have to be able to survive with some discouragement, right? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. So, renewing your brain, getting your brain trained, so that you can handle problems. Okay? Now, let me say this. That is the ultimate goal in trying to deal with depression and discouragement and all, all mental issues. However, there come things that defeat us here. Does that make sense? There are things that our coping mechanisms just can't handle. Sometimes it's a one-time, one-shot, one-off thing that happens and we get plunged out of something else. Sometimes there was something that happened in your childhood, some training. Sometimes it's a lifetime of stuff. Sometimes it's happened as an adult. Some, some people have PTSD. Some of you guys have PTSD. There are issues there. And the next step, remembering number one is coping, the next step is counseling. Okay? It's coping, then counseling. And I'm, I'm Keep in that order. I want to make sure we hit that, okay? Proverbs 13 10 says, Wisdom is found in those who take advice. So the idea that I have to figure out how to cope myself with everything that comes into my life is wrong. Now, that counseling doesn't necessarily start with somebody professional. Most of the time, the counseling starts with what? Friends and family members. People that can come alongside you and help you... Because sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes something happens and all you need is somebody to give it a little bit of perspective. A friend and family member who can do that. Now, let me say this right up front for, for those of you who have, who have friends or a or family member who ha- suffers with depression. I'm not saying your job is to fix the person. That's not how that works. But your job is to be there for the person and help them give, give them perspective, help them understand things a little bit more. Now, after the f- friends... After a friend comes friends, a group, a connection group, a group of people who you can bounce things off of, who can, who can hear you. You ever, you ever had a... Let me just say this about my, my personal when I've counseled people. One of the things I find over and over again, and it happens individually in a group, somebody comes into my office and they got something that's just eating them up, and we talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and they leave and say, you know, I feel so much better. And I didn't say anything of any value whatsoever. They came to see me. They spent an hour with me. I said absolutely nothing that had, should have any impact on their lives, whatever. But what happened was they talked it out and they processed it in my presence. I allowed them the space to do that, and that was helpful. That's, by the way, if you go to the book of Job, you'll find that Job's friends, they start out the book. Job has all this nasty stuff. Just stuff happened. Bad, 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 bad stuff. And his friends show up to help him, and for the first few days, they just sit there. They just sit there. And that's the best thing they do the whole book. It's when they just sit there. So you don't, try, don't, don't, don't think it's your responsibility to fix somebody who's dealing with depression or dis- heavy discouragement. Because you can't. Because the fix happens here when? When they develop the skills to cope. Right? That's how this stuff happens. Is you Something bad happens, you develop the skills to cope. If you can't do it on your own, you then find somebody to help you. It can be a friend, it can be a group of people, or it can be a professional counselor. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with having somebody who's actually trained in this stuff help you. I see a counselor once a month. Okay? Because you guys throw so much crap at me that I just, I just have to have help processing it, man. <laughs> now, some, sometimes it's not because of one individual thing. Sometimes you, your life gets really crazy, and it's nice to have somebody to help you sort things out and filter. So I meet with, he's a pastor and a counselor, and we meet once a month, 
and he's very helpful in helping me sort through stuff. Okay? Now, so we cope, then we have a counseling, and then the last piece in that is medicating. And I'm going to throw you a verse that's going to freak you out, just for the fun of it. It's also going to set us up for next week. This verse is from Proverbs 31, verses 6 and 7. Give strong drinks to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. You weren't expecting that one, but some of you just got a tattoo, don't you? Um, Now, let me point out something. The way the context in this, and when you take the entire Bible's reference in this subject, this is a temporary thing to help a person deal with an incredible crisis at that moment. And there are times in lives, not everybody's lives, but frequently in lives, where the counseling isn't enough, you need some medication, and what's the purpose of medication? The purpose of medication is to get you in a mental state where you can handle the counseling so the counselor can teach you the techniques so that you can cope. You understand that? That is very, 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 very important that you get that. The purpose of medication is always to get you in a condition so you can handle the counseling so the counselor can help you learn to cope. Now, I know for, for a lot of people, there is so much crap that has happened to you or you've been through or you might even have a chemical imbalance, you might have bipolar disorder, you might have something like that, where the medication will never, ever completely go away. Understand that. But the purpose is always not to lean on the medication, but to use the medication as a tool to enable better counseling. And the counseling's purpose is always, always, always supposed to be to teach you the techniques so you can cope. Got that? I know an awful lot of people who decide they're going to get medication or they're going to self-medicate, which we'll talk about next week. And they don't ever do the counseling to learn the coping mechanisms. And what happens, let me tell you what happens here. And some of you, I'm... When you depend on the medication to solve the problem, the medication cannot solve the problem because it's a mental issue and medication can't fix mental issues. It can just stabilize you so that the counseling can occur. When this happens, you develop a tolerance to the medication and you just need more and more medication. Okay? Nice and quiet like it's supposed to be when you say something like that. Because an awful lot of people have decided that medication is the answer to mental problems, to um, all kinds of things, when the reality is the purpose of the medication is to get you into, a, sta- into a, a condition where the counseling can be highly effective to teach you the coping mechanisms so you can deal with it. Okay? Now, again, there are people, there are lots of people, who have so much in their past, in their brain, in all these things, that the medication is never going to go away in this life. Because the problems are such that it's just going to... And there are people who will be able to get rid of medication and never be able to get rid of counseling. You're always going to have to have somebody to help you process things. And that's okay. This life is short. During this time frame, you may need that. Once you get to, to Jesus, we don't have to worry about that part. But all of us are always coping. And the, the goal is... All, are, are you guys okay with what I've just told you? I know you're processing. I know this is hard because everybody wants to... But the reality is... Now, here's the question. Okay, Steve, does the Bible teach me how to cope? What, what can I do about coping? Because, you know, maybe the medication has become my only thing. Maybe, can, can I, I'm, oh, by, this is free. I'm going to tick somebody off and you're just going to have to deal with it. If you go to a counselor and the counselor's only function is to to prescribe you medication, you don't have a counselor, you have a dealer. Okay? Who is enabling your problem. You need a person who gives you medication and then gives you the training to teach you to cope so the medication decreases over time. If you don't do that, the medication only increases over time. And the, the doctor gets rich... The drug companies get richer, and you get sicker. Okay? Again, you may, I mean, I've got medications that I take physical that are going to last the rest, probably the rest of my life, because of various conditions. 
Okay? You may have mental conditions that mean you're going to medication the rest of your life. That's okay. Don't ever lean into them completely. Now, let's talk about how, because I'm going I'm I'm to blow your brains away today. I really am. Promise. Okay? It's going to take work, but I'm going to blow your brains away. But first, I need to teach you a little Bible lesson. Just a little. This is an odd little sermon that goes in different places and comes back. Okay? The Bible contains three different types of, not guarantees even. It contains, let me give you three things. They're blanks. You'll like to fill these in. There are principles, there are proverbs, and there are promises. There are principles, there are proverbs, and there are promises. And they're all different. A principle in the Bible, as we scurry away for just a second to come back. A principle in the Bible is, this is God's nature. I'm supposed to live into God's nature. And when I live into God's nature, God blesses me, life runs better if I live in his principles. Okay? God is truth, therefore my life is better if I am honest. Principle, just how it works. Then there are Proverbs, and the Bible is full of Proverbs. There's a whole book of Proverbs, but they're found throughout the Bible. And a proverb is a general statement about life. This is how life works, and it's always stated in a pithy manner. It's memorable, easily memorable, but it's it's, it's not a guarantee. It's just this is how life generally works. Like one of the Proverbs is, a gentle answer turns away wrath. That's pretty good. You ever have it not work? You ever have, have somebody who got smoke coming out their ears, fire out their eyes, their hair standing straight up, and they're, they're yelling at you, and you do the gentle answer thing? I understand you're upset. Let, let, let's, let, let's talk about this. We'll be, and then they bite your he- head off. Right? Because a general answer turns away wrath isn't a promise. It's a proverb. Okay? It's, it's not saying it's going to happen every time. It says that as a general rule, when you live a certain way, certain outcomes tend to happen. The whole book of Proverbs is not a book of promises. I hate to break that to you. It's a book of Proverbs. When you live this way, generally speaking, life follows this path for you. Promises are totally different. Okay? Promises are easily the least common. And a a promise is this. God says, if you do A, I guarantee I will do B. Every time you do A or you live A, I will do B. Now, sometimes there are certain promises where God says, I'm going to do B, I don't care what you say. That's a certain kind of promise where God says, like, Jesus is coming back. That's a promise. doesn't matter what we do. He's coming back. Well, no, that's, that's happening. But there's a, there's, a, there's a few. They're not that common. Promises where God says, I guarantee you when you do A, I am going to do B. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, repents, asks Jesus to be their Savior, will be saved. That's a promise. Okay, that, that's not some proverb that says, oh, most of the time. No, every time A happens, B happens. Well, I'm going to show you a promise. It's actually mentioned as a promise twice in the book of Philippians. This is a real powerful passage, and um, I've actually taught on it just a few months ago. But, but in this case, this is what you need to hear. So we can, what, how do I say this? Maximize our coping, minimize our counseling, minimize our, our medication. Okay? So, Philippians 4, I'm going to start in verse 2. We're just going to read the whole thing, and I want you to listen to what's going on as far as promises. There's a promise that's actually stated twice in this passage. It starts out talking about two women. Now, I appeal to Yodia and Syntyche, whose parents needed the book. Didn't they need the baby name book? They really needed a baby name book. Anyway, now I appeal to Yodia and Syntyche. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Now, then he starts the next paragraph, kind of. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will, do that, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything, anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, um, I usually, my, my, the translation I'm more 
used to says, then the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. We'll guard your hearts and minds. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Okay? Now, next section. Where are we at? And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then what? The God of peace will be with you. Do you see that? Twice. Twice it says, peace, God's peace, the peace of God will be with you. What is the opposite of depression? Peace. So there's a promise in these verses that applies to depression. And any time you're frazzled, it's a promise. And promises are rare in the Bible. That God rolls one out here is impressive. Okay? So let's work through the promise. I want to take you through the promise one notch at a time. There's actually two clauses and then the promise. It starts out with this. When we, when we address and release the negatives, when we address and release the negatives, you'll notice the passage started, and we, we had those two women, you couldn't pronounce their names, Yuda and Syntyche, which I'm just guessing as to how to pronounce their names because they've been dead for 2,000 years and they're not here to ask. The first thing it did was the passage starts out by saying, you two people need to fix this thing. It's a problem. What does he do? He addresses it. He doesn't ignore the problem. He addresses it. He acknowledges it. He brings it out, puts it on the table, and says, there's a problem. And then he also says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Now, what's going on here? He's doing the exact opposite of what we do. You take everything that is bothering you, what does he say to do with it? To take it and give it to God in prayer. So all the negatives that I have, all the, all the, all the bad thoughts, all the anger, all, all these things that are bothering me, my job is to do what with them? To package them up and give them to God. To externalize them, to move them outside of it. Now what do we do? We take the negative thoughts and the negative things and the bad things and we internalize them, right? Isn't that what we do? That's our natural tendency is to internalize the negative. And Paul says, do the exact opposite. Take the negatives and externalize them and give them to God. He said, I don't know that I could do that. Well, Rick Warren has a real good response to, to that. He says, worry is focused thinking on something negative. Okay? Worrying. But meditation is doing the same thing, only focusing on God's word instead of your problem. So here's what's going on. You are internalizing your negatives. He says, take your negatives, Jesus says, and, and Paul says, and externalize them. Now, there's a problem. Do you have to be thinking about something? Are you like me? My brain doesn't do totally blank. There's always, you know, there's always something working in there. Not always a good thing for people, but there's always something working in there. And yeah, that's the right symbol for brain working, my brain working. Okay? Always working. What happens when you try to think about nothing? Everybody, I want you to stop for just a second and think about absolutely nothing. Right? So here's what we do. We take the negatives, we package them up, we externalize them, we give them to God, and then we try to think about nothing. And what happens? They just roll right back down into our brain. Right? Here, God. Because your brain's empty. An empty brain. Need something, that, that negative stuff that's part of your nature, that's part of your past, that is so prevalent in your life, it just rolls back into your brain again and you start thinking about it again. But that's not where he stopped. He starts with, to do that externalization thing, okay, Identif to address and release the negatives, but the next thing he says to do is to identify and internalize the positives, it said in verse 4, always be full of the joy of the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. That's positively thinking positive things and focusing on those. And verse 8 and 9, we saw that, that again. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So what's he doing? Externalizing the negative and then what? 
internalizing the positive. Taking your brain and intentionally shifting yourself so that you are processing and meditating on the positives instead of the negatives. Like I said, you can't just take the negatives and throw them away because your brain's got to have something in it all the time. So he says, take the negative, give that to Jesus, and then focus on the positives. And what happens when you do that? When we do that, when we address and release the negatives and identify and internalize the positive, God promises us peace in the midst of our problems. Okay? Then the God of peace will be with you. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. A couple things to notice. What it doesn't say. It does not say or even hint that your problems will go away because they won't. Okay? We saw the whole thing at the beginning. It said the peace of God which surpasses understanding. I say this many times. If you're sitting on a beach with a cold drink in your hand and the waves are lapping up there, having peace there does not exceed expectations. That's, the, that's just normal. When does peace surpass expectations? When life is going to crap. When everything is going wrong, when things are thrown at you, when there's just, you know, the kids are crazy, or well, two are crazy and two are sick, and the husband's deployed, and you don't know where he is, and your parents are having problems, and your in-laws are calling and bugging you, and you have peace in the middle of that, now that's peace that surpasses understanding. Right? So he's not saying, I'm going, to give you, I'm going to take away your problems in such a way that you'll have peace. He says, when you take the problems, the negatives, and you externalize those, and then you internalize the positives, I will give you peace in the middle of your problems. That, that, that's some weird stuff right there. That means that if you have a, if you say you have a bipolar disorder, that means God's promising that as you t- work to treat your, your, your symptoms, God will give you peace in the middle of it. doesn't say he's going to take it away. Unfortunately, I know people who are going to spend their entire lives with a bipolar disorder. Some of, you, some of you people have PTSD. And it's not saying God's going to take that away right now. It is saying he'll give you peace in the midst of it. Does that make sense? And it's not what we want. What we want is God to take away the problems. God, make it so I don't remember what my parents did to me. Make it so those words don't pop back up. Make it sure those actions... That's not what it says. What it says is, I will give you peace in the midst of your problems. Now, I've decided on an experiment. Because I don't know how many times I've read that passage. Therefore, brothers, whatsoever is true, whatever things are noble... Those of you who've been Christians for a while, you've heard that a lot. You may have, you may, you, 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 if you're like me, you tried to memorize it, but it's confusing because it just uses so many words. It's hard to memorize it. So, wh- what if we actually tried that? Because remember we started out and we said that the, 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 the goal is for us to cope, to, to learn the mental things so we can cope, and if we need counseling, that's okay to help us cope, and if we need medication to make the counseling more effective so we can cope, those are both good things. But the, the goal is coping, and if there's this thing that God says will give me peace, maybe I should try that. And so, I came up with an experiment for us. You get a handout when you came in? This is homework. Some weeks, some weeks I just can't squeeze it into 45 minutes, I apologize. It's homework. Here's what I want you to do. What I've done is I've taken those pieces, there's the things that are true and honorable and all that stuff, and I've broken it into seven days. Seven days. And I've assigned one each day. And what I want you you to do, everybody, whether you suffer from depression or not, I want you to take this once a day, I'm going to walk you through it in just a second, and take a minute or so every day on the exercise. You don't have to spend like your whole day. But take a minute on your exercise. Like, for instance, Monday. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true. Okay, what is, what's truth? Truth is what corresponds with reality. 
and I, I just have a special thing about what corresponds with reality because the m- thing that most corresponds with reality is what God says. And so the truest thing about you is what God says about you. So on Monday, this, Monday's going to take more work because I've given you a bunch of references that refer to what God thinks of you. He, these, not just what God thinks of you. The things that are true about you because God says they're true. Does that make sense? Why is it true? God said it. Okay, God said it's true about me, so therefore it's true about me. Now I have other thoughts in my head that, I, that my, my brain keeps throwing at me that are not true. So what do I do? I take those thoughts, I externalize those, and I give them to God and say, God, I'm thinking this now, but I don't want to think that anymore. I want to think what you think about me, which is what is true. And I want you to look up all those references, and I want you to pick two or three of them that speak to you the most, and I want you to write them down. And on Mondays, you can do it in the morning, you can do it before you go to bed, you can do it at lunch, whenever. On Monday, I want you to read and meditate. By meditate, I just mean read them over and over and over and over and over and over and over. For about a minute, just read those three verses and remind yourself what is true. Okay? Tuesday, fix your thick, think thoughts on what is honorable. Honorable means worthy of respect. And this one, I'm going to do something different. Is there somebody you respect? Is there somebody you would like to be like? You you respect that person. Think about that person and what about them makes you want to be like them. You can do that. Paul said in that that passage, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard me and, and saw me doing. On Wednesday, fix your thoughts on what's right. Right means just and equitable and fair. And this is a hard one because our culture focuses constantly on what's unjust. All the news feed is about what's unjust and unfair. Okay? So I want you to, for that day, I want you to package that up, give that to God. God, you're in charge of the injustice in the world today. I'll come back on duty tomorrow. And so today, you're probably not going to be able to do this while you're just sitting there. You probably just have to spend your day looking for it. Look for cases, look for instances where something is done that is just and right and fair. Look for those. Seek those out. Instead of spending your time seeking out the negatives, which is what we do all day, spend your time looking for positive things. Thursday, fix your thoughts on what's pure, that's moral purity, looking at people and things that are morally pure. Friday, what's lovely? Lovely means giving pleasure and satisfaction. What's that mean? What do I want you to do that day? What does he want you to do that day? What makes me feel good? There are things in your life that when they happen, they make you happy. There are things that when they happen, they make you sad. Focus on the things that make you feel happy. Does that make sense? For about a minute. You don't have to do it all the time. It'll kill you. I try to do it all the time. Saturday, what's admirable, worthy of praise. Sunday, what's excellent and praiseworthy, what's outstanding, what was amazing this past week. That's the experiment. For the next few weeks, I want you to do this every day. Okay? I want you to look up those verses. Now, this is not some rocket science thing. I threw this together and then had Heather print it out in a few minutes, just taking the verses, and, you know, we may come up with a better version later. But this is the prototype of saying, God says, if I do A, he'll do B. He promises me this. So I'm going to trust him enough to try. Can I tell you something? Tell you something, this is, this is mean, but it applies to me too. A lot of times we come upon a promise like this one, and we don't have enough faith to carry it out, so we just skip it. God says, whatsoever things are true and noble, and if you think about these things, God's peace, his passionate understanding will guard your hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. I don't believe that'll happen to me. I don't think God will answer that prayer for me. I don't think God loves me enough to answer that prayer in my life, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put God to the test. Well, anytime God says, if A, then B, he is inviting you to put him to the test. He doesn't do it often. This is not a normal thing in the Bible. But once in a while, he says, you need to know this. So if you do this, I guarantee this. And a lot of times, we don't have the faith to believe that God loves us enough to carry out his promise in my life. And I am challenging you that God does indeed love you enough that if you will focus and do A, he will do B. If you will externalize the negatives by handing them over in prayer to God and internalize the positives by meditating on them on a daily basis, God will increase the peace level in your life. 
Now, I'm not saying he's going to fix everything. I'm not saying that you'll never have to go to a counselor again. I'm not saying that if you have on medication, he may take it off. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying he will increase the peace level in your life guaranteed if you do this. Don't believe me? Try it. Put God to the test. God, I don't believe you love me enough, so I'm going to do this. <laughs> or better, God, you say that you love me. I probably should just accept your word for that one because you are honest. And I want you to report back to me. Not tomorrow. I want you to wait a week or so. Every day. If you miss a day, just pick it up the next day. Or seven days in a week. If you get five of them a week, you're doing great. Just keep it up. A couple weeks. And I want you to start sending me messages. Steve at spoutsprings.org. I want, you, I want you to start telling me how God's working in your life. And if it falls apart, if you, if you suddenly fall, I feel worse, then let me know because that would be weird. Because I believe God. And in this case, I'm going to believe God enough that I'm going to do what he says to do when he's A, so he'll do B. We run around, can I be really honest with you? I mean, this, this discourages me. We run around and run around and run around and we try everything in the world to get peace in our lives. And God says, do this. And when our peace level decreases, what do we do? We do everything but that. We'll try absolutely anything on earth if it doesn't involve actually doing what Bible says you should do to get peace. We, I mean, I, hate, I shouldn't say this. We run to get our medication increased. We schedule one more trip to the counselor. We self-medicate. We find distractions. We'll do anything in the world except what God says to do here. And I am challenging you, I am challenging you as your pastor to listen to God this time. Give it a shot. Let me know how it works. And I'll let you know how it works in my life. Because all of us want more peace. Is that not a true statement? So, you have your assignment. I don't give homework very often, but this one's an intense one. Now, along the way, at the very beginning, I talked about salvation and how salvation is not determined by one action. It's determined by having a relationship with God. And really, this peace promise that God has for us is built on the fact that God's Spirit lives within us. And if you don't have the relationship with Christ, then God's Spirit doesn't live within you. That's, unfortunately, that's how that works. And so when I've talked about having peace by meditating on positive things, and that's not going to work very well for you not as well as it will if God's spirit lives in you if you have a relationship with Christ and if you'd like to talk to somebody about having a relationship with Christ that's what a blue bag is for we have some on the corners of the platform we have some on the back if you grab one of these bags somebody who's been trained will take about 10 minutes they'll walk you through the contents of the bag show you how to have that relationship with Christ so you can start living into all these things that we te teach every week if you've have the relationship, you want to be baptized, let us know. That's the next step. We do baptisms first um, Wednesday of every month. We'd be glad to line you up for the next one. If you want to start stepping into God's plan for your life, we have our step classes. Uh, step two class, which you can start with if you need to, is tonight at 6 o'clock in the Steel Fortress. We've also, if, if there's something I said that you want to pray about, we've got a cross in the corner. And the, the reason that's there is so that you can pray. During this next song, if you want to go over and pray about anything in the world, that's cool. If you want to pray with somebody, we've got some people lined up around the outside of the auditorium who'd love to pray with you. If you want to take communion to remind yourself what Christ did for you, we've got a communion station in the back, one in the front. Just during this next song, feel free. So let me, let me give you your assignment one more time. If we address and release the negatives and identify internalize the positives I'm challenging you on a daily basis God promise us, promises us peace in the midst of our problems you're going to have problems you want peace in the midst of them you have your blue sheet you 
have your assignment. Now go challenge God and get your peace.